to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Say it with me, the mountain of God. Come on, you can do better than that. The mountain of God. At the mountain of God, look what happened. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him. In a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire. But the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Father, thank you for your presence here today. I know that I know that I know that you're going to speak to us this morning. Father, so I'm availing myself to you, and I'm just saying, God, speak. Speak today, God, speak. Lord, today, restore the hurting. Lift up those that have fallen, Father God. Father, I pray that this morning, Father God, you will hope will remain alive in the lives of those that are going to be hearing your voice this morning, Father God. I pray, Father God, for my brothers and sisters that are in this building, but also those that are watching via the internet. Speak, God. Speak, God. Speak. I pray these things in the name that is above all names. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Look at your neighbor and tell him when God shows up. I would like to share with you today on the subject when God shows up. You see, in every instance that we read in the Bible of God showing up, Something happens. Tell somebody, when God shows up, something happens. These appearances that, that we read about in the Bible of God showing up, these appearances are called a theophany. Uh, and a theophany is a temporary visible manifestation of the presence and the glory of God. I'm going to repeat that. A theophany Every time you read about God showing up in the Bible, that's a, that, that's a theophany. And a theophany is a temporary, visible manifestation of the presence and the glory of God. This may be a natural phenomenon like we read about right here with Moses. Such as a cloud of fire in a human form or in prophetic visionary experiences. How many has God, how many of you that are here this morning, has God shown up in your life through a dream? Has God ever spoken to you in a dream? Well, we will learn today that when God shows up, he shows up for a reason. God is not just going to show up to show off. God shows up for a reason. God shows up to allow us to understand who he is. There are, there are different effects and there are different functions for theophany. There, God shows up to reveal his glory. And we can read in scripture from Genesis to the book of Revelation, but I'm going to just share a couple with you. In Ezekiel chapter 10, it says, verse number four, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple and the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of brightness of the Lord's glory. Listen to what Exodus says in chapter number 40. It says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses, Moses, the man of God, was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. 
I, 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 I want to suggest to you this morning that, that, that you pray this prayer. That you will say, God, I need for you to show up in my life. I need for you to show up in my house. I need for you to show up at my workplace. I need to show up in my bank account. I need to show, I need for you to show up when I go see the doctor. I need for you to show up, God. Theophany not only uh, uh, are reveal or reveal the glories of God, but theophanies cause, they cause the fear of God. When God shows up, he causes fear in men. Exodus chapter 20, it says, now all the people witness the thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, listen to this. When the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. They trembled. Verse 19. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear you. But let not God speak with us lest we will die. Ay, 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 ay. And Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you. And, 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 that, and, and, and it says, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Ay, 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 ay. God is not just going to show up so that you can see something special, so that you can feel goosebumps behind your head. God is going to show up for a reason. God shows up to put fear in your heart. Some of us need God to show up every day. I know I do. I need God to show up every day in my life. I need the fear of God day and night, night and day, 24-7. I need for him to show up in my life. So God's theophanies, God's showing up, they, they, show, they, they happen to reveal God's glory. They happen to cause the fear of God in our lives. And, and God, God shows up to commission his servants. In Ezekiel chapter 1, the Bible says, Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice, one speaking to me. And he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. God wants to speak to you this morning. God wants to speak to you this morning. Can you say amen? amen. Can you say God speak, God speak? Another reason why the God, God's, God's, uh, God appears to us, why God shows up. In, in, in theophanies is to authenticate God's servant. So God not only wants to commission you this morning, he wants to authenticate you. Now, you guys are very smart people, smarter than me. What does authentication mean to you? Help me out, guys. When you read this product is authenticated, what, do, what does that mean to you? It's proven that it's authentic, that it's real. What else should I say? It's a seal of approval. God, when God shows up, he shows up to authenticate you. God shows up to commission you. And when he shows up and commissions in you, and, and, and then the next thing he does is he puts the seal of approval. This product is authentic. Look at the person next to you and tell them, baby, all this here is authentic. Ay, ay, ay. Look at your other name and tell them, you heard them, you heard me talking about me. Oh, this is real right here. I don't know about you, but all you see here is real inside of me and all around me. Hallelujah. All that's inside of me, all that's around me, it's real. Shaka maso halaya. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Exodus chapter 24, verse 16. Now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, while everybody's looking at the mountain, on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And all the people that were there understood this is the man of God. You see, God is going to allow you to go through stuff. God is going to allow you to be surrounded by people while you're going through the midst of stuff. And you might want, see, the problem with us is that I guess we can call it pride. We don't want people to know when we're jacked up. 
when things are going wrong, when things are going bad in our life. So we try to hide it. We don't want people to know about it. But God has a way of showing up, hallelujah, and placing you in the midst of the people so that everybody knows that how jacked up you are. Tell somebody this morning, I didn't want you to know that. I didn't, tell them, I didn't want you to know that. But see, God will place you in front of everybody. Then in front of everybody, he shows up. And he will call your name in front of everybody so that they can understand, though he's jacked up, though she's jacked up, I can still use them. I still have purpose for them. I still want to glorify myself through him. First church, we went to pastor. They took us up there, appointed us on a Thursday evening. Pastor went over there, district pastor, appointed us. That was on a Thursday evening. Sunday morning, my first Sunday, I show up with my wife and my four children and nobody else did. They left us out in the parking lot. Baby, Jasmine, oh my God. Church, you know who, you talk, you know who I'm talking about. Baby, that was their loss. Jazz, that was their loss. They left us out in the parking lot. I got back in my car with my kids after we waited an hour and 10 minutes in the car. Got up, walked around, got back in the car, got up, walked around, went around the building to see if somebody was there. Nobody was inside the building. I said, no problem. Got back in my car. And when I got in the car, I looked at my wife and I said these words to her. I will not ever come back on this mountain. Then I said, let me fix that, unless God tells me to. <laughs> yeah, I had to throw, that's very important. That's very important. I had to throw, I said, God's gonna have to show up. So you know what? Camp meeting was the following week. The tabernacle was full in Allentown, Pennsylvania. The preacher, the preacher name was Brother T.L. Lowry. There were storms going on. It's the month of June, and we get a lot of storms up north, just like we do down here. Storms going on, so his flight got delayed. I'll never forget the sight. I'm driving to this camp meeting because my bishop called me, and he asked me, how did the service go? I, I, I laughed. I said, service? What service? I said, there was no service. He said, why was there no service? I said, because they left me and my family out in the parking lot. And, and, and he said, so, so what does that mean? I said, well, bishop, this is what it means. I'm not going to go back to that place. Obviously, they don't want me as their pastor. And they don't want my family. There. So if they don't want me and my family, that's okay. I'll go back to my church. I'll continue to be a member just like I've been for the last seven years. And I'm fine with that. He, he said, what will it take for you to go back to that mountain? I said, God's going to have to speak to me. He said, that, oh, he said, let me ask you one more time. What will it take for you to go back? I said, God's going to have to show up and talk to me. He said, that's not a problem. I'm thinking Bishop's going to say, oh, wow. Man, that's going to be kind of crazy. How's that going to happen? He said, are you coming to camp meeting? I said, sure. He said, don't forget, we start on Thursday night. I said, I'll be there Thursday night. The preacher is delayed. They're extending the worship part. And I'll never forget, this black limousine just pulls up alongside the tabernacle. And out of the tabernacle, this six foot, four and a half feet tall white boy comes running out of the limo from the back. He didn't even wait for the driver to open the door. He runs right on top of the altar and worship was going on he he, he greets the bishop he says I, I'm, I'm sorry let me get a mic they give him a mic he said I apologize my flight got delayed but I, at 35,000 feet God told me I want you to go to that tabernacle because I need to speak to one man there today if nobody else hears you he's going to hear you and he said God told me that there's a man sitting here tonight he said that man you were on an assignment from God the people hallelujah did not want to receive you the people didn't know what blessing God was sending to them but God is telling me to tell you it wasn't the man who sent you up there it wasn't the bishop who sent you up there it wasn't church of God who sent you up there I sent you up there and you gotta go back I'm here to tell you today that when God shows up God will speak to your circumstances he will speak to your situation God will turn your situation around Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hamashaya. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. When God shows up, he does it with purpose. He does it for a reason. He does it to approve you in front of men. He does it to remind you that he has a purpose and a calling on your life. I am reminded of a story of three Hebrew boys in the book of Daniels. The Bible reads in the book of Daniel chapter number three, starting in verse number one. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue, 90 feet tall. Let me repeat that. 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. And he set it up on the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and they stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Then a herald shouted out, and this is what the herald said, people of all race, just like we have them here this morning, people of all race and people of all nation and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, this is what he said. He said, you are to bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. And anyone who refuses to obey will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language was, they bowed down to the ground and they worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But some astrologers went to the king and informed him on the Jewish boys. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issue a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the scyther, the lyre, the harp pipes, and all other musical instruments. That decree also states, he who refuses to obey must be thrown in a blazing furnace. I imagine the king saying, okay, yeah, yeah that's what I said. Uh, you don't have to remind me. I, I, I know what I said. And, and they, they, they continue. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm in charge. No, no, no. You got to say that like you're really in charge. I'm in charge. No, 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 no. You got to say it so the devil can hear it this morning. I'm in charge. Yeah, yeah, because the devil is a lie. He said, whom you put in charge. Oh, over the province of Babylon, they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Listen to verse number 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, he flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. And when they were brought in, listen to this, I love this scripture. When they brought him in front of the king Nebuchadnezzar, he said to them, is it true? I, I, I just want to hear it from you guys. Is it true? <laughs> Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I've set up? Listen to verse number 15. <laughs> verse 15 says, I will give you one more chance. I We'll give you one more chance. That's kind of a little too late. Because you already shouted. Who's in charge? I'm in charge. Yes, yes, yes. Let me go on this side. Who, who, who's in charge? I'm in charge. Now the enemy, the enemy 
wants to come and threaten God's people who already know that who's in charge. So the enemy comes and says to them, I'm going to give you one more chance. Kind of late, kind of late. Because when you understand that God is for you and that God goes before you and that they're more with us than those who are against us, no matter what kind of lie from the pits of hell the enemy wants to invent against your life, when you understand that you are in charge, the devil say, I'm going to give you one more chance. This is how you respond when you're threatened by the enemy. And the enemy seems to have authority over your life. This is how you respond. He said, I will give you one more, sh one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you re refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Listen to their response. Wait for it. Here it comes. Wait for it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. They, didn't, they did not address him as king. They did not address him as majesty. They did not address him as authority. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. Hallelujah. He's able to save us. He, hallelujah. He's able to save us. He will rescue us from your power. But then it says, but even if he doesn't. Even if he doesn't. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to make it clear to you. Hallelujah. I told my wife on the way here today, you got to call the devil out. You got to tell him how it is. You got to speak to the devil and call the devil a liar every single time you have an opportunity. You got to call him out. Hey, listen to what they say. Listen to what they say. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you. They say that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Yikes. What? Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face became distorted with rage. How many seen the post of my daughter Jasmine with her mad face? You saw that? Okay. Just erased Jasper's name and put Nebuchadnezzar underneath there. <laughs> the face became distorted with rage. Listen to this. Listen to this. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. I'm going somewhere with this. I'm going somewhere with this. Because the theme is when God shows up. He commanded, he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So now they're bound. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they were throwing in the three Hebrew men. Look at somebody tell them it was hot up in there. Look at somebody else and remind them it got hot. Patora, you know how to say that better than anybody. Say it, Patora. It was hot. Say it, Patora. It hot. It got hot. So Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego securely tied. They were securely tied. They fell into the roaring flames. Listen to me. Listen to me. Some of you find yourself in the midst of a fiery furnace this morning. 
Some of you are in there and you're looking around and the first thing that comes to your mind is, why am I still alive? This trial that I'm living through right now was supposed to take me out. What I'm experiencing right now is not normal. What I am experiencing right now is supposed to have killed me. And God has sent me here today to remind you that when he shows up. You see, the trial that you have experienced in life and the trial that you're going through right now, it was not intended to kill you. Look at somebody and tell them, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. You see, Daniel and his three friends, their, their Hebrew names, I, I want you to hear this. Each of which exalted Jehovah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's not their name. Okay? Their names were changed to Babylonian names, whose meaning are not clear, but may have been intended to honor another God. Let, let me enlighten you and help you this morning. Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious. That was changed to Shadrach. But his true name is Hananiah, which means the Lord is gracious. You see, when, when you walk in, 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 the, in the attitude of Hananiah, you do what Adrian was asking us to do. You're grateful. You're thankful. Because you understand, the, every time people call them, what they were saying is, God has been gracious with you, Hananiah. God has been gracious. You see, when you know who you are, when you know your true identity, you can then walk in that identity. Ay, 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 ay. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means the command of a coup. The Sumerian moon god. How do you go from the God is gracious to the moon god? It don't even match, does it? I'm not done. I'm not done. Mishael. Mishael, which means who is what God is. In other words, <laughs> he, when Mishael walked around town, he knew what his name meant. Who is like my God? In other words, there is no other God like my God. Wherever he went and he showed up, he showed up saying, who is like my God? Imagine his worship when he came to the tabernacle and he lifted up his name. All he had to do was remember what his name was. Who is like my God? Hmm. Hmm. All hell breaking loose around him and he's worshiping who is like my God. But listen, they changed his name. They changed his name. His name now is Meshach, which means who is what a coup is. What is that? They didn't even know. But listen to the third, to the third Hebrew kid. His true name was Azariah. And you know what Azariah means? The Lord has helped me. Oh my God. <laughs> he will show up. All hell is breaking loose. And when soon as Azariah showed up, everybody shut up. Because the first thing that was coming out of his mouth, I was going through hell. Things were looking bad. But thank God that my name is Azariah. And y'all all know what that means. That means that the Lord has helped me. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm getting there though. Getting there though. Daniel. The other Hebrew boy. Daniel's name means my God. Or, or my judge is God. Daniel names means my judge is God. This is important. Because people love to judge. People like to judge the book by its. They don't know what hell you've been through. 
They don't know what experiences you have lived with God. They don't know why you worship the way you worship. They don't know why you can't stay quiet in the midst of the servant. They don't know why you shout out hallelujah, glory to God with nobody else. They don't know why you stand up when everybody else is sitting down. They don't know why you lift up your hand. They don't know. But Daniel's name was changed to Belshazzar. And Belshazzar, you know what that means? Baal protects the chief Babylon God. How is it that the enemy couldn't find another name to put on one of God's boys than to understand this boy has authority? And because he has authority, I'm going to name him Baal is he who protects the Babylonian God. So this is what happens. This is the result of the name change. Are you ready? Though the enemy may want to change your name. He can never, ever, ever change your true identity. He can never change your DNA. You are a royal priesthood. You are a child of God. You are a woman of God. You are a man of God. Ay, ay, ay. Woo. Hallelujah. You see, the enemy wants to confuse you. So in the midst of your trial, in the midst of the fiery furnace you're going through, he allows these changes to happen. But I want you to understand that while you're going through your fiery furnace, God doesn't just sit on the sidelines to watch your reaction. No, 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 no. If you keep reading the story in chapter number three, the Bible says that the king noticed something. Tell the person sitting next to you, he, the enemy's going to notice something. Tell him, tell him, the enemy's going to notice something. The Bible said that the king was sitting down, and as soon as he looked into the fire furnace, he stood up. And he asked the soldiers that were around him, were they not three Hebrew men that we threw in the fiery furnace? They all replied, yes, your majesty. He said, well, I see four. Yes, yes, yes. Wait, wait, I got to read this. I got to read this. Because you got to hear what the enemy saw. You got to hear this. I was so excited. It was about 545 this morning when I, when I, when I, when I read this. It says, the king, <laughs> the king, it says, therefore, because the king command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame killed all the soldiers. And then verse 24 says, King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke saying, counselors, did we not cast three men bound up into the midst of this fire? They answered, yes, king, true, O king. He said, look, I see four men loose. They were bound when they went in. <laughs> but he said, look, I see four men and they're loose. They were loose, walking in the midst of the fire. And then, look, 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 look what he says. Not only are they loose, they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth one is like the Son of God. <laughs> then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fire furnace and he spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servant of the Most High, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they came out from the midst of the fire and the sarchas, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors, they gathered together and they saw these men whose bodies the fire had not power over them. The hair on their head was not singed, nor, they were, nor their garments was affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Let me talk to you about the fire for a little bit. Moses saw the fire. What caused him to get closer was that the fire, though it was burning, did not burn the bush. That blew him away. How in the world is it that this bush is not consumed? Then we read about 
these three Hebrew boys that are thrown into a fiery furnace, all bound up. And in the fiery furnace, the enemy who threw them in there now is looking at them and now they're loose. May I suggest to you this morning, number one, that the fire of your trial is not going to kill you. Look at somebody, tell them you're not going to die. Tell them you're not going to die. Look at somebody else. Look at somebody else and tell them it can't consume you. It can't consume you. And, and, and tell them, tell them. As a matter of fact, you're going to be delivered. You're going to be delivered. You're going to be delivered. You see, I want to suggest to you this morning that the trial that you're going through, that the trial that you're facing, it does not have the intention of taking you out. It does not have the intention of killing you because it can't, because it can't. The fire that you're going through or the trial that you're living through is the fire sent from heaven. And there's God's fire and there's the devil's fire. God's fire for the church is never intention to consume or kill you. God's fire is to purify you. God's fire is to cleanse you. God's fire is to sanctify you. God's fire is to empower you. God's fire is to set you free. It's to set you loose from all bondage. Ay, ay, ay. Somebody's getting delivered this morning. Somebody's getting set free this morning. You can't. Ooh. You came in here when, and you were listening to the devil. The devil is telling you, I got you. You're all bound. You're all set up. And God is telling you this morning, no, 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 no. I'm going to get inside of that ferny fire with you. God's fire is intended to set you free. God wants to set somebody free this morning. The enemy wanted to change your identity. And God said, you can call him whatever the hell you want, devil. But I know their true identity. I know their true name. I know who they are. Because from the womb of their mama's belly. From their mama's womb. I chose them. Look at you and never tell me he chose me. If you, if you can't look at nobody right now, just raise your hand and thank him this morning. Say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You need to thank him this morning because you're not going to die. You need to thank him this morning because this trial is not intended, hallelujah, to mess you up, to jack you up. This fire that you're going through this morning is going to set you free. I can feel the presence of God in here. Oh, my God. The devil is alive. There's one, there's more, more story. One more story. Thank you, Father. 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 There's one more story I have to share with you. The disciples are in a room. They're in this room because their master has just been crucified. And he's now in the tomb. And the Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, the disciples all came together and they went into a room. And in that room, they were discussing the events that had just taken place. They were nervous. They were afraid. And as they were discussing everything that just had happened, the Bible says that 
with the doors shut. See, you, 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 you. some of you just read that and said the door was shut and Jesus came. No, 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 no. You got to take your time when you read the Bible. Because there's an emphasis there. While the door was closed. Other version says, while the door was still closed. Other one says, while the door was shut. Jesus walked through the shut door and showed up. And li li listen to what comes out of his mouth. They were all nervous. They're afraid. And Jesus says, he goes, through, walks through the door and goes, peace be unto you. Immediately, they understood, this is God. Number one, how can you walk through a wooden door? Second thing they thought is his spirit. Because we saw him be crucified. This is a spirit. So Jesus knowing what they're going to think and understanding that in their midst was a guy named Nicodemus. And also knowing that in their midst was John, Peter. And also knowing that there was a guy that had testified to all the disciples, lest I see with my own eyes. I won't believe. Jesus called him by his name. And he says, you, come here. He says, look at my hands. When that disciple gets up, there's holes through his hands. Then he says, look at my side that was pierced for you. But while all that's going on, Jesus wants them to understand, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. I just invited this guy to stand up so he can touch my flesh. So now they're saying, okay. Jesus said, I don't think they really, really understand that I'm not a ghost. So this is the next thing he says. I'm hungry. Let's eat. If I would have been one of the disciples, I'd be like, yeah, that's my boy right there. Yeah, we're going to eat. It's about, it's about to be. Last time we ate with this guy, out of two little pieces of bread and fishes, we fed about 15,000 people. What you want to eat, God? What we going to eat today? He said, let's eat. I'm hungry. What are the lessons that we are to learn from today? How can you put this to practice this week? First of all, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. You can't call yourself a daughter of God, a son of God, and still be bound by the enemy. Every time you mess up, he's going to accuse you. Every time you fall short, he's going to remind you. But God has sent me here this morning to remind you that when he shows up, everything changes. Something happens. And it's to benefit you and I. How many of you can say amen to that this morning? You need to leave here today understanding that one day in your life, God showed up. That same God who presented himself in that fiery burning bush, the same one who went into that fiery furnace, the same one who went through that wooden door, is the same God who you fell in love with when you first met him. And every time he showed up in these instances that I'm speaking to you about, he changed the atmosphere. Everything changed when he showed up in that fiery furnace. Everything changed in that room of confused men when Jesus showed up. And this morning, everything changed in this room right here. As worship was going on, I was loving it. Worship was banging this morning. I looked at my wife. I said, I can't wait to preach today. I can't wait to preach. I can't wait to preach. But it wasn't me. It was the God inside of me that knew he wanted to speak to you today. Today you're set free. Today you are free. The enemy had captivated your mind. He was accusing you and God is saying, I'm setting you free today. Let's bow our heads right there where you are. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for showing up. 
Thank you for showing up in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Even when we don't deserve it. Even when we don't understand. But especially when we're confused. Especially when we are afraid. Especially, Father God, when we feel like we're alone and abandoned. Thank you for showing up. This morning, we worship you. This morning, we praise you. I want to do an altar call this morning. You see, because perhaps we have someone here today. You're here, but your walk with God, or in your walk with God, you've been struggling. The enemy has been tormenting you. And God wanted to speak to you this morning. And he wants you to know that when he shows up, there's not a devil in hell or the devil himself that can stand the presence of the almighty God that's within you. And today, God is saying you don't have to leave here with all that bondage and all that stuff that you were carrying when you came in. So I want to invite you to come out of your chair and come to this altar so that we can pray together. But I also want to extend an invitation for those friends that are with us this morning. You hear, and perhaps this is not your first time. But you have not made that commitment with God. You have not stood and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior before men. And, and you might say, like many of the people want to say today, well, that's something personal between me and God. Well, 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 I, I beg to differ. That's not what God says. He says, if you will confess me before men, then I will confess you before my heavenly Father. Yeah, because people want to be politically correct. That's why we have so many churches that don't do what I'm doing right now. They don't do altar calls no more. Oh, we don't want to offend people. You know who's going to get offended? If you accept Jesus Christ this morning, the devil. That's who's going to get offended. But not God. God said, if you confess me, I'm going to confess you. So friend, I'm going to invite you. Leave your seat. Surrender your life to God. He wants you to understand that he has a plan, purpose for you, for your life. And that his plan and purpose is to bless you, to restore you, to strengthen you. That's what God wants to do. I invite you this morning. I invite you this morning. Father, thank you. 